Hi, hello. It's such a big honor to have you today, really. Oh, thank you. No, I'm delighted to be here. <laughs> it's so exciting that it's Fashion Revolution Week. Yes, you know, I would like to start a little bit how we connect each other. I would like to tell a very, very short story before, you know, that you start to speak about Fashion Revolution. Okay. It, it was... Uh, like uh, um, late October, I was, uh, you know, in my bed watching on Instagram, you know, you scroll down and you watch page. And then it appeared the trailer of the Blue River. And I saw that it was made by Fashion Revolution. So then I start to look at Fashion Revolution page. I found your profile. I found other people's profile. And then I also, because you are also the um, crew member, of the expedition from Galapagos to Easter Island. So I follow day by day, every step of this expedition as well. This is how we get in contact and this is our first speech. <laughs> oh, amazing, amazing, yes. I mean, we didn't actually make the River Blue um, film, but we did collaborate on sharing it around the world. And I spoke at the launch of it in New, in New York. So we were very closely involved in, in the film itself. And uh, I read a little bit about the history of the fashion revolution on your website, fashionrevolution.org, that this movement is started after the Rena Plaza disaster in Bangladesh. This is how everything started. And uh, I would like to know more and spread more about this beautiful movement. And every year you do a fashion revolution week. And so we can speak about uh, this. Yes, I mean, I think it's important also just to talk a bit about my, my background in the industry, because for sort of 20 years before, um, before Rana Plaza as well, I've been working in my own um, small sustainable brand, Patrakuti, which produces fair trade and sustainable Panama hats. And we were one of the few brands in the world that had fully transparent and traceable supply chains right back to the raw materials. We actually knew the GPS coordinates of each parcel of land, where our straw grows and the GPS coordinates of all of our weavers' houses as well. So I understood that transparency and traceability were really important in order to give visibility to all of the artisans in, in the supply chain and make sure that they were you know, justly valued and remunerated. So... In 2013, you know, I'm sure we all remember that just terrible day watching the Rana Plaza factory collapse. And it was really clear to me, as soon as I saw the activists having to search through the rubble to try to find out which brands were producing there, I knew it was that lack of transparency and responsibility which was costing lives. And I knew that we had to find some way of making sure that a tragedy of this scale didn't happen again. And I was actually just having a bath a few days after the, the collapse. And the idea for Fashion Revolution, the name, the idea of doing something on the anniversary, literally just, just hit me as an idea. And it seemed like a good enough idea to get out of my bath and do something about it. And here we are seven years on. Fashion Revolution is the world's biggest fashion activism movement. Um, you know, thanks to everybody listening and watching and everyone who's got involved in the movement. So first of all, I have to say thanks to you and thanks to this uh, wonderful organization and movement that we are more aware because, you know, before um, I read about a fashion revolution uh, website, I didn't know about the Reina Plaza disaster. So you make me more aware about this situation. And now I will act in a different way, you know, than before. Every year is uh, evolution. Every human has to e evolve, you know. And this is a more, a very important what you do because you, you give awareness to people. Well, that's right. And I think we also want to take people on a journey with us. We've got a, a mantra in the fashion revolution is be curious, find out and do something about it. And so it's, you know, sometimes people just, you know, they, they don't know much about it. And that's why it's really important to give them, you know, list more ways to get involved to find out some of the statistics um, that, that we give to people about the impact of the fashion industry. And then some of the ways to get involved, like asking that question, who made my clothes? And then if people want to find out more, we have um, things like our massive open online course, which is going to be running next month, which is on the fashion's impact and the sustainability, de sustainable development goals as well. So we have lots of different ways people can get 
involved. And I think it is, it's that just that, that deepening of awareness. So for instance, we've had the hashtag, who made my clothes, which we've been running for several years now. And this year we've added that with a new question, what's in my clothes? Because the fabric, the materials. About the fabric, the materials, but also the composition of our clothing, all of those chemicals which are in and on our clothing. I mean, take school uniform, for instance, everything that makes a school uniform easy care. I, mean, I don't know about where you are, whether children have school uniforms to go to school, but they're often sold as being, you know, easy care, non-iron, scuff resistant. Then all of the chemicals that make these textiles so easy for parents to care for mm -hmm. are damaging to, to our health, to children's health and to the environment. I mean, mm -hmm. Teflon coats a lot of school uniform has been found in the Arctic, in, in polar bears. It's really pervasive in the environment. I can I can tell a very very short story that happened to me in 2013. I went for my very first time in China, in the south of China, Guangzhou, with a Chinese friend, and I see for the the first time thousands and thousands of fashion factories. And you know, at that at that age in 2013, I was super excited to buy some new clothes, and it was very cheap. And I remember that I buy some black pants in velvet. I wear it for the day and then for seven or 10 days, all in my legs, I have like dark purple uh, tash, tash, I don't know in English. Uh, yes, and yes, I mom. wash it, I wash it with, under the shower with soap and it doesn't disappear for 10 days. This very dark black, black uh, on my skin, it stay for a long time. And this scaring me, you know? Yes. It is, and I think what's really scary is that so few brands publish their restricted substances list. So we really have no way of knowing what chemicals go into our clothing. So today, it's so exciting, we've published the fifth edition of our Fashion Transparency Index. So um, you're one of the first people I can talk to about the, the results. And so only 40% of brands disclose their restricted substances list. So really for 60% of the world's biggest 250 brands, we just don't know what chemicals are in our clothing. We don't know what's allowed, you know, whether these are banned chemicals. And I know um, you mentioned earlier on Next Expedition, the sailing research for which I've just been on. And Emily Penn, who's the co-founder, decided to have her blood tested for 35 of the chemicals which are banned by the United Nations. And she found 29 of them in her bloodstream. And we probably all have similar levels of chemicals. And, you know, it's pervasive. You know, when we go to sleep on our pillows, there's flame retardants on them. All of the soft furnishings that, that we buy, our sofas, they're all coated in chemicals. And so they are pervasive in our, in our clothing and in the environment as well. Do you think that it's possible that in the future, when we go in a shop and we buy something, it will be read it uh, which uh, colorant they use. You think that it's something that it's, I don't know, maybe it's already exist in some, in some shop or in some brand or not yet. I don't know if there's that level of detail, but if they, if they publish the restricted substances list, which is the list of banned chemicals, then we do know what's not allowed in our clothing. So for instance, some of the top brands in our fashion transparency index will publish that information. Um, but so few brands, only 27% of brands are publishing their progress towards eliminating hazardous chemicals from our clothing. So that's only just over a quarter of the top 250 brands. Um, only 29% of the brands have any like, measurable long-term goals to eliminate these harmful chemicals. So that's basically three quarters of brands who aren't doing anything to eliminate these hazardous chemicals. So we really need to be asking them you know, as responsible consumers, um, what's in my clothes? That's our new hashtag question. Because we know that, you know, our skin is, is our largest organ. And we just don't know. There's just not enough research about how these chemicals are absorbed into our bloodstream. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's really, it's really, you know, I'm, it's interesting to know that, you know, our skin really absorb the, the product. Mm. It does, and you know, children as well, particularly as I was mentioning, school uniforms, they're running around in the sun, in the playground, 
and they're absorbing these chemicals into their skin. And I think we're particularly at risk as women as well, because it can affect our endocrine system and our fertility. And actually the body burden of chemicals gets passed on from mother to child. And this can accumulate throughout generations as well. So as women, we're particularly at risk. And again, that's another reason why it was really important to participate in this ex-expedition sailing voyage, because it was a wonderful all women crew who were on board. Mm -hmm. And a question that I would like to ask you uh, concerning the fabric, the materials. Do you think it's more sustainable natural materials like cotton or linen? Or now I see, because I went recently in January to the Pitti Fashion Fair in Florence, and I saw many brands that are talking, we are sustainable brand, we are sustainable, we, recycle, we, we do it like nylon recycle, you know, recycle of nylon. But nylon is not like cotton or linen, it's not natural fabric. So I, my question is, does nylon, is sustainable or is better to use natural fabric? It's so difficult. I mean, unfortunately, there really are no easy answers. Cotton is one of the, the most polluting plants um, on, on the earth. It uses huge amounts of water. I mean, a pair of jeans uses the amount of water in the production that we would drink in about 13 years. A T-shirt uses the amount of water we would drink in two years. It's a huge amount of water. And considering cotton only covers 3% of the world's agricultural land, it, co it uses something like, I think it's like 13% of the insecticides and pesticides. It's, it's really significant. Um, polyester, you know, it, it's plastic. It comes from fossil fuels. A lot of brands are investing in uh, recycled polyester, which has about half of the, the carbon impact. But the, at the end of the day, it depends on how that's disposed of. It still sheds microfibers when we wear it it still sheds the same amount of microfibers every time we wash it. So when we wash, put on a wash using, you know, with mixed fabrics, about 700,000 microfibers goes out into the waterways. Yes. And then into the, the oceans. So this is what you did in the research of expedition, because, you know, yeah. it's, not only, it's not only a big plastic bottle that floats on the ocean, but it's about the micro, micro, micro plastics. Exactly. So there are better fabrics. I was listening to a really interesting discussion on a Fashion Revolution's YouTube channel. We have a series of fashion open studios. If you go to fashionopenstudio.com, you can see all of the information about what's happening. And our YouTube channel has the, the videos from yesterday. And there was a fascinating conversation hosted by Susie Lau with lots of people working in the denim supply chain. And it was really interesting to hear more about hemp because I've said for years that we need to be using more, more hemp. It's antimicrobial, um, it's antiviral. We should be making all of our hospital you know, uniforms out of, out of hemp. It's, it's a really incredible fibre, and you, it uses a lot less water as well. Um, linen is another fabric that we should be using more of, and we'll be seeing a lot more sort of lab-grown fabrics, lab-grown fibres going forward as well, I believe. So I think there will be advances but, you know, we also need to be really careful because, you know, there's things like, um, you know, um, we talk about vegan leather. Well, vegan leather is basically plastic. So just do your research. Don't accept things at face value that might seem good. But, you know, just, just dig down and do your research. And you have to choose things which actually fit, fit with your values. You spoke before about the washing clothes. If you wash, you know, like polyester, then microplastic go to the ocean. But also, uh, maybe we can speak about uh, the product we use for washing, the soap that we put in the washing machine. These also, they exist because I remember you did a one month sailing uh, and I did a few times sailing. And I remember the skipper always say, if you come to sailing, you have to use a special soap when you do shower that is biodegradable. That's right. I mean, you know, but biodegradable is, is the basic, I mean, especially when you're, you're sailing, but everything should be biodegradable. In order to minimise the reduction um, of, of microfibres leaving our clothing, I mean, there are conflicting scientific papers, but it's generally accepted that it's best to use a liquid detergent and liquid conditioner. It's best to wash on short cycles and at cool temperatures. 
And at the end of the day, we all need to be washing our clothing a lot less. We don't need to wash our clothing as much as we do. You know, I look at our neighbours and they have clothing out on their washing line every single day. We, you know, I wash my clothing very little. I actually don't think I washed any clothes at all on the X Expedition <laughs> voyage. But a lot of us just wash our clothing, you know, every time we wear it. And we really don't need to be doing that. And especially jeans. I mean, a lot of the top jeans manufacturers say we shouldn't be washing our jeans. You know, you should be going for a year without washing your jeans. You can refresh things. You can hang them up in the shower. You can buy different sprays to deodorize them. But we shouldn't be throwing things in the washing machine every time they you know, get a small mark on them. I usually just stain, I just, just sort of spot um, stains off of things when they do get dirty. But we shouldn't be washing things as much as we do. And choosing the right fibres has a really important role to play. So I have some you know, gorgeous like wool and Alexander McQueen dresses, which are really fine wool. And they just don't need washing. You know, you can take them anywhere and they never smell and they need washing very, very infrequently. Uh, there is a question here. Which are the famous brands that you think are doing good work with production transparency? Well, the brands at the top of the Fashion Transparency Index this year are... H&M, C&A, Adidas, Reebok, Esprit, Patagonia, Marks and Spencers. And then when we look at the luxury brands, Gucci actually came out top of the luxury brands, um, followed closely behind by some of the other, the other caring brands as well. Um, but we are seeing luxury lagging, lagging behind. But there are unfortunately still so many brands who are scoring Zero. I mean, brands like Tom Ford, Max Mara, Mex, Ali Tahari, Jessica Simpson, you know, quite well-known established brands who are really disclosing nothing or, or next to nothing, which is, is still really, really shocking because most brands, if they're operating in Europe, if they're operating in, in the States, they will be dis disclosing some information through their California Transparency and Supply Chains Act, through the UK's Modern Slavery Act. So we normally expect people to, to disclose at least, you know, get a couple of points at least. Uh, do you think that maybe in the future, instead of made in Italy, made in China, made in uh, Bangladesh, it will be uh, maybe made by Antoine, made, made by Farah, made, made by, you know, the person, if it's possible, because, you know, the supply chain is so long, there is so many people who work in one piece. Exactly. I mean, there are some small sustainable brands who do that. I have a backpack from a Mexican brand called Someone Somewhere, and it gives the information about, about who, made, who made it and where it was made, which is written inside each, each product. And there are several brands who are giving that level of transparency. And I think that's why it's important to support these, these smaller sustainable brands who are working in a more transparent manner. But also, you know, it surprises me every year. Lots of people ask that question, who made my clothes? And we often do get answers. So, for instance, people have asked Zara most years, and most years they have responded, and they've responded with quite detailed information about some of the processing facilities, so where the, the clothing might have been washed and laundered and dyed, even where it was woven. So brands do have this level of transparency. We might not actually know the names of the people, but we can find out this information. And there are some quite big brands who are publishing photographs of their workers with the hashtag, I made your clothes. So we can see some of the workers. For instance, I've been looking at Gildan, which isn't a well-known brand, but they're in one of the top 100 brands in the world. And they do a lot of T-shirts, which are often printed for for other people, they're a massive, massive T-shirt company. I've been to some of their facilities in, in Haiti and seen the produ production process. And at the moment, all of their factories are making personal protective equipment, PPE. And so they're taking this opportunity to show some of their workers making the masks and making the gowns with posters saying, I made your PPE, and with the names of the workers. So I really encourage people to look at the hashtag I made your clothes because it really is so joyous seeing all of the different people. There's I made your socks, I made your hat, um, I made all sorts of different things. And it really is a way of starting to to connect with these people who are making our clothes. But sometimes, you know, we see I made your clothes and maybe it's a woman in India or in Pakistan or in Bangladesh. And then when you buy in the shop, it's written made in Italy or made in France. And then, you know, there is like not... Um, 
a balance in what you buy. You say, oh, wow, I buy a made in Italy, made in France product. And then you see, I made my clothes and it's made somewhere else. So I will speak, I, w I would like to, my question, I, I try to re request the, the questions. Is it like logical to put made in France, made in Italy? Because maybe it doesn't make, it doesn't make any more sense to write this. And it also it creates, I think, is my opinion, it creates some racism as well. Because sometimes I see, I sell some clothes to, to boutique or to people and, and people say, no, 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 no. I only buy made in Italy. But a lot of factory in Italy, they are Indian workers. So what is the difference? Yes, exactly. I mean, a lot of the clothing that says made in Italy, it's basically, you know, it's, it's finished in Italy. They might put the zip in, they might even just put the label in and, and pack it up in Italy. And I think consumers know now, I mean, most of the customers of these brands, I mean, maybe they don't, but I would think that a lot of people do understand that, you know, a lot of the shoes that say made in Italy, you know, they're, they're all made in Eastern Europe and they're just, you know, compiled and, and you know, the, the last stages are done in Italy. It's the same with a lot of the clothing. It might be made in, in Southeast Asia. Um, I've been to the tanneries in Bangladesh and I've seen where the leather is tanned for some of these mass produced luxury brands, many of which will say made in Italy on them. And it's shocking. It's absolutely shocking. There's child labour, young people working, no safety equipment. They're sitting on the piles of hides in their bare feet, bare hands. And the effluent from these tanneries is going straight out into the river, which is the home of red listed river dolphins. It's so shocking. And these are producing for some of not the top luxury brands, but those sort of you know mass produced luxury brands, the names which we're all all familiar with but some of the more you know accessible luxury brands so we need them to be doing a lot more in terms of of transparency and actually paying a decent wage to their workers as well i mean please don't tell me that these big luxury brands can't afford to pay the little bit extra to pay their embroiderers in india a living wage but that really isn't happening and you know the, the profit margin they're making is is enormous and we know that the labour cost of a, a normal item of clothing is usually between one and three percent so we really do need these brands to be taking responsibility for their workers especially when they're using home workers in India who at the moment because they're in no legally recognised form of employment aren't even getting any um, you know state protection or, or money from the brands when they've been laid off because of the Covid pandemic so, so yes, brands, especially luxury brands, really need to step up and take responsibility for all of the people working in their supply chains. There is another question. Do you think that fast fashion retailers are making good steps toward disclosing more information about their supply chain? To what extent sustainable fast fashion collection really sustainable? Yes, I mean, we're certainly seeing the high street leading the way in terms of transparency in disclosure and they have for many for many years i mean the sort of mid-priced and luxury ranges have been um slower to catch up although outdoor clothing and sportswear is also making really good good progress as well you know we're seeing brands like patagonia scoring extremely well adidas reebok so um yes yes but what i mean i think what is really important to say is that transparency doesn't equal sustainability and it doesn't equal responsibility either i mean we've seen in this pandemic you know it's been so shocking to see that some of these the world's biggest fashion brands many of which are you know doing really well in our fashion transparency index have not stood by their suppliers they haven't accepted orders or they haven't accepted all of the orders which have been made and we've seen a devastating impact on workers in India, in Bangladesh, Cambodia and other countries of the cancelled orders by these, by these brands. So yes, transparency doesn't mean responsibility. All it does mean is that we can find out more about these brands' policies, procedures, their impacts, their social and environmental impacts. And this is really important because it means we can hold them to account in exactly this kind of situation. One of the issues we're covering in this year's Fashion Transparency Index as well is purchasing practices. And that really is, is an area where brands need to improve. So, for instance, only 15% of brands disclose 
any kind of a responsible exit policy. So this means that they don't just you know, cut and run from, from their suppliers, that they have a process when they stop working with a brand to do it gradually so it doesn't, doesn't hurt the workers. And so few brands, I mean, only a couple of percent are actually disclosing that they, um, I think 15% of them ring fence labour costs in their price negotiations, and only 2% are disclosing what percentage of their orders for what percentage of orders the labour costs actually are ring fenced. And this is really important because it means that it makes the suppliers address the incredibly low wages that people are earning because it will mean that they can't push down the cost of labour. They might be able to negotiate on other aspects of production, but the cost of labour is, is something which has to be isolated and it can't be negotiated by the brands. Um, and it's, you know, it's shocking when I visit the factories in Bangladesh, they tell me that the brands and retailers are paying between 3 and 5% less for the clothing every year. And yet they still have to meet you know, the cost of making their factories safer and paying their workers higher wages. I started to do, you know, not long time ago, a little research about uh, a, different, uh, um, a different solution uh, for... Um, when the people, when brands have to ship the clothes, even from the factory to the boutique, and then maybe to the boutique to the final customer, they always put in a plastic bag to protect during the shipping, especially it's from it's coming from uh, you know other countries. Do do you know? I did some research, but didn't find anything. Do you know if exists something envelope, you know, like uh, that you can protect the the clothes? But it's not, in, it's not a plastic bag, maybe something else, do you know? Um, yes, there are, there are alternatives. Um, there's quite a few alternatives. Some of them are made from cornstarch, you know, and again, that has its own issues, because should we actually be you know, growing land for, for corn when it could be used for, for agriculture, for, for growing food as well? Um, but there are some, some good biomaterials out there. Um, and you know, and unfortunately, most clothing does need to be does need to be packed in in something to protect it. Um, I know. Um, I remember listening to Finisterre, and I believe they've got Finisterre is an outdoor sort of outdoor brand, and they do surfwear and and that sort of thing, wetsuits. And I believe they have um, completely biodegradable bags, which which they're using. And, you know, it's really shocking. One of the statistics in this year's Fashion Transparency Index is whether, you know, do, do brands disclose their measurable progress towards eliminating virgin, virgin plastics? And that's both for virgin plastics in our clothing, like polyester, and in the packaging as well. And it's only 27% of brands who are disclosing any progress towards, towards reducing virgin plastic. So we really need to see brands starting to address this, this thorny issue of, of packaging. You know, it's another area of, of waste, along with all of the clothing waste, which is piling up in warehouses at the moment as all of the retail stores are closed. Yes, I'm just searching if there is other question. How about all the events held in the name of fashion. Is there information of the impact of those events, like celebrating feeling across the globe to attend on event in New York Fashion Week, etc.? Oh, yes. I think somebody did do some research recently. I can't remember who it is or where it is, but I remember seeing recently something about the carbon impact of Fashion Weeks. And, you know, of course, it's staggering. And we're really excited at Fashion Revolution to have the first sort of international schedule, um, which is being held entirely digitally. So we have 49 designers in 12 different countries as part of our Fashion Open Studio showcase. And I think it's, you know, this is exciting because it does show that we can operate with, um, you know, with, with Zoom, with technology, and we don't all need to be flying around the world. You know, we've said for a long time that really fashion weeks are, are obsolete. We need to find different ways of... Um, to present the, the collection. And that's why we've had our Fashion Open Studio initiative for the last two or three years. So what normally happens is that designers, from, you know, well-known designers like Vivian Westwood to smaller sustainable brands, normally invite people into their studios to learn more about their processes and do different workshops. 
And it's so exciting that this year it's actually online. So instead of just, you know, 20 people participating in, you know, what's quite a small designer studio, we can open these events up to hundreds or thousands of people through the, the events on the website and through the, the ones on our YouTube channel as well. I, I consider myself, you know, like a little revolutionary dreamer. And uh, one year ago, uh, I made a small uh, capsule collection of clothes and I call it Four Season Collection. And I was wondering if in the future, instead of doing so many fashion week, you know, fall, winter, spring, summer, and all this because it's going so fast, if it was it's possible, maybe it was just a dream to do only one fashion week instead of two, spring, summer, and fall, winter, and make only one collection, four season collection, because now with the global warming, it can be cold and, 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 and warm, and we travel a lot. So you can go from one continent to another country, and the, the, the weather is totally different. So it doesn't make sense really spring, summer, and fall, winter. I think it's just my opinion. What do you think? Yes, I mean, you know, I, I kind of wish there were only two collections a year, but what we're seeing in many cases is that there's, you know, 10, 20, up to 50 collections a year from some of the, the fast fashion the fast fashion brands. So I, th I think it's going to take a long time until we, you know, get, get beyond having the, the different collections, spring, summer, autumn, winter. But I think what we will start to do is, because, you know, this kind of pandemic isn't going to go go away we will see see um you know more more pandemics like this in the future it's very likely so i think we will see less seasonality we will see um brands and retailers creating more clothing which will you know which will will last if this kind of thing happens again it won't be as trend driven they will be able to put that clothing back on the shelves again in six months 12 months time so i think a lot of them will be reassessing the way in which they work as well and i think also you know a lot of us as as customers of these brands, we're starting to reassess, to reprioritize. And as we start to face, you know, an economic downturn, for a lot of us, it is clothing, which is going to be the first thing, you know, which we're going to stop spending our disposable income on. And that is going to really impact on the brands. And hopefully we're going to find other ways to, you know, love and cherish the clothing already in our wardrobes. We have an initiative called the Fashion Revolution Love Story and a hashtag called Loved Clothes Last. And we ask people just to fall back in love with the clothing already in our wardrobe, because the more we love our clothes, the more we care for them, the longer they're going to last. And this is what we really need to see happening. Uh, there is some, someone say, hi, Carrie. I just want to ask you, what do you think the situation become under control and how fashion industry can behave in the future? What is your opinion in this? Yes, I mean, I think, you know, the current pandemic has brought to light really just how fragile the system really is. We've witnessed decades and decades of brands ch chasing ever cheaper production and the resulting impact on, on workers. So now when these workers have been laid off, they've been furloughed or dismissed, um, they haven't even had their last month's salaries. They have no savings at all to fall back on. They have no safety net, no social security as well. So I think this crisis really proves exactly why transparency is so vital, because some brands have been responsible business partners to, to their supplier partners, and other brands have, have not. And I think in order to build a more responsible supply chain, as we come out to the other side of this pandemic, we really need to see that brands starting to, to value the their workers' livelihoods more than their shareholders' profits. Because really these brands have, they have the ability, they have the resources, they have the lines of credit, and they have the moral imperative as well to do something in this situation. And it really comes down to that stark decision. Are they prioritising their shareholders or are they prioritising the workers? They can make that choice. And we should help them to make that choice by putting pressure on them and asking them to be responsible business partners. And here I see another question. Isn't the best solution to sustainability meaningful reduction of consumerism as Patagonia promote? Because the alternative proposed, despite being valid, may sound as pilative. pilative? So if we reduce the production and the consumer, we say, okay, I reduce 
my consumption as well. So instead of buying uh, 10 pair of jeans and uh, 50 pair of t-shirt every year, I just reduced the, the quantity. Yes, and we are seeing that happening already. I mean, we've seen the, the clothing rental market is booming. It's actually grown 21 times faster than the clothing retail market in the last three years. I mean, that's staggering. And it's being led by the young people. And it's expected within the next decade, it's expected that rental will be bigger than, than fast fashion. So things are changing. People are changing their habits. We were supposed to have the world's biggest ever clothing swap happening. Oh, you know, of course, that, that can't happen at the moment because of the current situation. But we will be doing that another year or, or at another time. So people are looking for different ways to, to consume. Some of my favorite clothing is, is bought um, on clothing resale sites like Vestiaire or in consignment stores um, or, or on eBay. So I love buying secondhand because you can buy you know, better quality, you can buy designer clothes, you can buy really beautiful clothing that you're going to love and it will last for longer. Um, and I also buy a lot of clothing when I'm overseas. I mean, this top I'm wearing, you probably can't see beautiful embroidery. It's from a brand called Dominga in Ecuador. Um, I have a lovely bracelet on from Carolaga in Mexico, which is made from the, the scraps from a, a cotton factory, the leftovers from the cotton factory next door. And so whenever I'm traveling, I actually invest and spend the time with a lot of these sustainable brands. And I love it because it's so slow. I've got some beautiful embroidered skirts, um, which have taken between six months and a year to embroider for me. And I almost forgot that I've you know, made the order and paid for them when I've been in Mexico. And then a year later, they're ready for me to pick up. Um, I had a really beautiful dress I, had, I ordered from a brand called Rocinante in Oaxaca. And it's so lovely. And that took probably about six or seven months. And it was all, all of the lace work was done by hand. All of the embroidery was done by hand. I could choose my own colours. And it's so much more precious to me because, you know, I had that part in the production process. It was made for me. And I know the time. I know the labour that went into it because I had to wait for it. And we've lost the habit of waiting. I remember my daughter saying to me, she said, you know, we don't have time to fall in love with Chloe anymore in a shop window and to save up for something we really want. Because by the time I've saved my pocket money for it, this was years ago, she said, by the time I've saved up for it, you know, it's gone out of the shop six months earlier. And it's true for those of us that don't have the money to, to spend on clothing that we love. You know, it's lovely having something that we can, we can save up for and something that we have to wait for. You know, that pleasure of waiting for clothing, whether it's something that your mother's making for you or something which a small sustainable brand is making. I think it's something that we need to start to, to learn and appreciate again. Mm -hmm. And do you think sustainable fashion influencer can encourage customers to engage in a more conscious lifestyle and ethical fashion consumption? Absolutely, yes. I think if uh, some influencer, they can start to talk more about this and instead of, you know, buy tons and tons of clothes and changing dress every day to go for dinner, it would be better. You know, you buy just a few beautiful dresses that you can wear it more time. I watch, I watch one time a documentary. I don't remember if it was in TV or in YouTube. Eh? And they say that UK teenager, UK teenager, especially, you know, middle class, you know, low, low middle class, they want to buy every night a different dress to show that, you know, not they are rich, but, you know, to show that they are a lot of stuff, maybe because they look richer, I don't know. Yes, yes, it's shocking. I mean, in the UK, we have the highest level of consumption in all of the European countries. I believe it's double um, the, the clothing consumption of Italy. So it, it is shocking. And we really need to see, you know, we really need to be producing reducing this, this consumption. I mean, we produce about 150 billion items of clothing a year. And very few brands are disclosing how much clothing they're putting on the market. But the ones that do are disclosing staggering amounts. So Inditex, for example, who own, you know, Zara, Pull&Bear, Biosche, and, and, and other brands under that Inditex stable, disclose that they put 1.6 billion items of clothing on the market in 2018. 1.6 billion! I mean, that's an astonishing amount of clothing, it really is. Mm -hmm. 
There is one girl who asked, write down some name of small sustainable fashion brand so that I can start buying from them. I think now in this life, we don't have time to write all the name of the brands, but probably maybe in our next post, maybe I will do in my own page, in my blog, The Fashion World, I can make a, a little post and maybe because some of them I know some sustainable brand, but some of them I don't know. So I can, we can just write, uh, if you are a sustainable brand, just write a comment so people can know about. Yeah, and I would recommend looking at our Fashion Open Studio, it's fashionopenstudio.com, because everybody on there is a sustainable brand. Really great place to start. But also, like I said, be curious, find out and do something about it. Do your own research. Because we all have different priorities. For some people, it might be animal welfare. For other people, it might be, um, you know, labour rights, human rights. You know, we all have different things which are important to us. And it's really hard to find brands who are covering everything. And I think we have to, you know, we have to look at which issues are important to, to us and research the brands that we want to buy from there's a number of apps out there so look at the app like good on you which is is a sort of rating ranking which ranks it more on sustainability because the fashion transparency index is really only ranking transparency i just tried to do a screenshot to remember the question and here somebody asked a question for you valentina i think you're wearing very different out outfit will you explain what are you wearing and how you rate future of sustainable fashion. Carrie, you also tell us, please, your opinion about this. So if it's ask me what I'm wearing, here I have a um, cashmere, cashmere sweater and also I have a cashmere scarf that I made in uh, Nepal during my trip. I go to Nepal since uh, four years after the earthquake to give uh, some help, volunteering volunteers help. At the be beginning was just a uh, little help, like giving some shimini for people living in the Himalayan little village. And then uh, uh, the, day, the year after I start to build the orphanage. And every year I go to check the, the work uh, to follow step by step the construction work and if the children are good, if they need something, you know, instruction, medicament. So I go every year and I found uh, during my trip, because it's since now fifth time that I go to Nepal, I found many factory and I visit them, a lot of them, you know, some of them are small with only five, six employees, some of them 20, 30 and big factory, maybe they have 200, 300 employees. And I found uh, beautiful because the people were are so loving and caring and they show me how they made, you know, and I was, for me, I learning every time I learn how they made. And cashmere is one of my favorite fabric. fabric. <laughs> yes, it's, you know, it's such a wonderful opportunity to, to go and see how our clothes are made. And that doesn't have to be overseas. You know, there's a lot of really amazing workshops in, in Europe that we can we can go and see as well. You know, there's a lot of people making clothes on, you know, all of our doorsteps. We just need to go and, and search them out as as well. But it's, yeah, no, it's, it's always fascinating just seeing and understanding that process. And particularly when you go back all the way, you know, through the dye process, back to the raw materials, you really appreciate the time and effort. I mean, in Bangladesh, I did an indigo dye workshop. Um, I've been several times to Porfirio Gutierrez and his sister Juana in Mexico. And Juana is an amazing um, dye master and uses just, you know, such a range of different, different natural dyes. And Porfirio um, makes the most incredible, incredible weaving. Once you just start to realise, you know, there's those, it's, it's high craft, it's really, you know, there's artisanal skills which are passed down from generation to generation. Even the Panama hat, Patrick Cootie's Panama hat, you know, the, the finest ones take weeks and weeks to weave. And these are really skilled artisans. You know, it's been recognised by UNESCO as intangible cultural heritage because it really is a skill which is, you know, sadly in danger of dying out because a lot of young people, you know, they've, they've got different aspirations and don't want to remain in these rural communities and learn the traditional skills. And there is Ali who asks, what are the conditions of the work factory in Nepal? So since my experience that I visit uh, around 10 different types of factory, the conditions are very good. The place are, you know, like nice, uh, 
you know, nice building and the people are happy. They invite me to, you know, to, to check how they do. They are happy to show me how they do. And the people are very kind, you know, after they say, oh, they want to invite you to their home for dinner. They're very like the hospitality in this country are incredible. Really, you can learn a lot of, from this country, right, from these people, a lot of things. And um, so we, we talk uh, around 50 minutes, almost one hour. It's incredible because there is so many interesting things that we can say. Uh, maybe you can repeat uh, uh, that we can, people can go to fashionrevolution.org and the, the message, the Fashion Revolution Challenge is ask the brand who made the, my clothes and yeah. what, <laughs> what in my clothes as well. In my clothes as well. And also if you go to the homepage of our website, there's a pre-populated email um, which you can send to the, ba the brands all you have to do is put the name of the brand in and it will send it to the brand. Say, look, hey, so-and-so, I'm your customer. You know, I love your clothes, but I want to know what you're doing. Are you honouring your contracts at this time in the pandemic? You know, what are you doing to make sure that the workers in your supply chain aren't suffering? These are some of the most vulnerable workers, some of the most vulnerable people in the world. So that's a really easy thing that people can do very effectively. Thousands of people have done it already. And brands really do take notice of this when they get emails from there their customers so yes please do that fashionrevolution.org and then fashionopenstudio.com as well for the fashion open studio events there's some really fascinating things happening with you know sort of dyeing and denim and weaving and zero waste pattern cutting and th there's so much happening so anybody interested in finding out about that sort of thing please please check that out as well thank you Carrie. thank you so much for your work for your enthusiasm and for the great thing that you and your team are doing. So follow Fashion Revolution page on Instagram and uh, remember to ask the brand, please uh, let me know uh, who made my clothes and what inside my clothes. I thank you, thank you, thank you so much because you know, for me it was such an honor to speak with you, really. Thank you, it's a pleasure Valentina, lovely to talk to you. And I hope to meet you in person very soon. Yes, very much hope so. Thank you. Big kiss to everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.